And uh, we, we now will hear Dr. Juan Ignacio Engelmeyer from uh, Buenos Aires on COVID-19 and permahypertension. Juan Ignacio. You're on mute, Juan Ignacio, you're on mute. We don't hear you. Ah, sorry, sorry. So uh, thank you, Professor Goten. Um, thank you, Professor Quadrelli, and thank you, uh, Professor Canteri Antonio, for inviting us to this important meeting. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to share with you, um, with, to, with colleagues from Europe and from around, around the world in, the, in this very important meeting. Uh, so I will start for my presentation, first of all, a, a, a caveat. I am an, an ILD physician, but I am very glad to, to talk about pulmonary hypertension because I also work and see these patients um, and COVID-19. So as you know, uh, we are living an unexpected moment uh, for which no one was prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and I never imagined that I was going to see this in my life, eh? the Central Park converted into a field hospital uh, with temporary hospitals in the, in the middle of, of Manhattan. Neither I imagined I would to see the, the FEMA exhibition complex in Madrid, Spain, converted into a temporary hospital. Here I'm with some colleagues and friends, and friends who are from from Argentina, all most of us attended last year the ERS, and we and we we know very well this uh, huge uh, convention center. Uh, luckily, now it's it's closed because the worst of the pandemic in in Spain in, in Spain uh, has gone. And neither uh, I never imagined I, I want to see the this the the Panima Stadium in São Paulo. The, sorry, the the Pacambu Stadium in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, our friend, uh, Professor Leticia Cabano visited, visited uh, recently and she told us that it is converted into a, a temporary hospital. So we are living in a historic moment uh, for, uh, never, uh, for nobody of us was prepared for this. But uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that we are all learning about this virus. We have learned a lot, a lot and very fast in the past six uh, months, but we still need to learn so much. And most of, I will say, is based on a very low uh, quality of, of evidence. Uh, there's a growing um, amount of, of publication in the past two or three months talking about we are facing COVID-19, we are facing an endothelial disease maybe. And we are uh, facing endothelitis phenomena across vascular beds of several organs, uh, the hearts, the kidneys, the lungs, and the liver, etc. This is one of the publications uh, where we can see thickening um, uh, intralveolar septums with multiple microtrombi in the in the capillaries. This is another publication, huh? and we can see this is the normal uh, alveolar endothelial unit uh, in the left side, and in the right side we can see the loss of the vascular integrity, the activation of the coagulation pathway, and inflammation. What? But what we do know is that SARS-CoV-2 has a huge vascular affinity. This nasty virus has a huge vascular affinity. And we do know that coronavirus binds the ACE2 receptor and through these mechanisms access the cells, access the endothelial cells in arteries and veins, 
access the smooth muscle cells on, of arteries, of bronchial epithelium, of type 2 pneumonocytes, and access the cells of epithelium on small intestine and immune cells, for example. And uh, through binding to this receptor, the S2 receptors, the coronavirus causes pneumonia and uh, respiratory stress syndrome in the lungs and causes thrombosis, acute, subacute, or chronic in, in arteries, veins, and in, in the vascular system as a whole, and also causes endothelial dysfunction hmm, in lungs and in kidneys, for example. So uh, one of my first take home message today, it is that we are facing a virus, a nasty virus, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, which has huge vascular affinity. Eh? And a phenomena of endothelitis may play a central role in the pathogenesis of this disease. But we will talk about thrombosis. We will come back talking about thrombosis soon, a couple of slides. Uh, but uh, now let's talk about the impact of COVID-19 of our patients with pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and as we know, since many years, the mortality risk of these patients from acute respiratory exacerbation or, or, or acute respiratory processes is very high. Uh, so what we can expect, expect from pulmonary hypertension patients in COVID-19 if they get infected with this virus? We can expect maybe an increased mortality. We can expect maybe a high prevalence of respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, we don't have so much data published yet, but preliminary data is showing something different from what we originally thought. This is one of the publications from a group from the US, from the United States. And as you can see, eh, 32 US pH centers answering a survey. Uh, and the, and we, in all these centers uh, had only 13 confirmed COVID-19 cases, but only seven of these uh, need hospitalizations. Uh, and six were managed as out of out, outpatients, and only one died. This is an, another case series from the Hospital Los de Octubre in Madrid, Spain, um, Dr. Brila Escribano. Uh, and as you can see, 10 patients with pulmonary hypertension and COVID 19, half of the patients only developed mild symptoms, and within those uh, who, de uh, who developed pneumonia, all had good evolution without need for intens intensive care or deaths. So <clears throat> maybe we are facing a paradox um, because these, these patients are not, not, not uh, going so bad and are not doing so bad. Okay, I will present here some hypotheses that why these patients are doing better than we originally thought. Uh, you know, because it's part of the pathophysiology of the uh, disease pulmonary hypertension, that ACE2 expression is decreased in, this, in pulmonary hypertension. And also there is a lymphocytic, inflama lymphocytic inflammation surrounding the alveolar units, which is also part of the pathophysiology of, of pulmonary hypertension. And these patients, uh, have a, a severe endothelial dysfunction also as part of the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension. These three things may be uh, limiting the viral entry into the cells. It is an, hypoth an hypothesis. We, 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 we really don't know, but it may be. Uh, another thing we can, we, can, we can think it is maybe a protective, a protective effect of the, of the drugs, of the specific pulmonary hypertension treatments or maybe the anticoagulation. But on the, other thang, on the other hand, we can also think that maybe these patients are protecting them, themselves and using masks and staying at home. If we talk 
about the medication, the pulmonary hypertension specific medications, and thinking maybe that, that these drugs uh, can be protecting these patients, maybe through pulmonary vasodilatation or maybe through the anti-proliferation effects, or maybe through the anti-thrombotic effects of these drugs, they, uh, these drugs can, can be protecting the patients. But we really don't know the answer. Furthermore, in severe COVID-19, uh, as you know, there is an abnormal hyperperfusion of non-ventilated areas. This leads uh, to a low uh, ventilation perfusion uh, balance or rates. This is part of the type L uh, distress syndrome huh? um, described by, uh, by Professor Gattinoni. And in this, in this context, maybe a, vasodil a vasodilator treatment could prevent the severe hypoxic vasoconstriction response, which worsens the, the oxygenation. Mm -hmm. This is another hypo hypothesis. And could favor a better ventilation perfusion balance. Okay. But coming back to the thrombosis, uh, to thrombosis and to inflammation, as we uh, spoke before, if we think about, and if we talk about inflammation plus thrombosis, we are all thinking about maybe chronic thromboembolic pulmonary disease with or without pulmonary hypertension. Okay, but how prevalent is thrombotic disease in severe COVID-19? Well, we have lots of publications in severe cases in the past two or three months. Uh, and as you can see, the prevalence of thrombosis despite thromboprophylaxis in severe uh, COVID-19 patients in ICU and in hospitalized patients range between 30, 33% and 12%. As you can see, it's, it is high, it is very high, but we must be careful uh, interpreting these results because all these patients were studied, um, uh, were studied in a high pretest probability context of having thrombosis because they were in ICU, hospitalized, and maybe there's a, a bias towards an overestimated uh, prevalence of, um, of thrombosis in these patients. But it is a high prevalence, as you can see. So another take home message from today it is that thrombotic disease is frequent in ICU patients with COVID-19. But another important question that we can ask ourselves is maybe we are facing in situ thrombosis rather than pulmonary embolisms. Let me show you some uh, evidence and some publication in, in this regard. Uh, this is a, a very nice uh, paper from Ranucci, uh, which shows that there is a correlation between fibr fibronation uh, levels and interleukin-6 levels. Mm? leading us to think maybe in an immunothrombosis phenomenon. And if we, if we study the clinical and tomographic characteristics of these patients, we can ask, are we facing a different phenotype of thrombotic disease in COVID-19 patients? As, can, as, can we, see, as we can see here uh, in this very nice paper also, the areas of thrombotic lesions, hmm, tend to be more peripherics and tend to be in the same areas of organizing pneumonia in these patients. And also these patients have less prevalence of right ventricular dysfunction. So maybe pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 may represent a different phenotype of disease. And maybe in situ, in, in situ immunothrombosis rather than venous thromboembolisms could be the mechanism, the mechanism of, uh, of thrombosis. So there is an accumulating evidence to support the immunothrombosis mechanism rather, rather than the uh, pulmonary embolisms, the classical mechanisms. So maybe 
we have to add two faces to this now a classical picture or graphic, eh? talking about the, the stages of COVID-19 uh, infection, stage one, early infection, is stage two, the pulmonary phase, and stage, stage three, the hyperinflammation phase. Maybe we have to add, add uh, a fourth uh, stage, a thrombotic stage, eh? and a fifth one, the fibrotic stage, which is very important for, for us, for, for, for ILD doctors in the future. We, we need to follow, to follow up these patients to detect and to diagnose early this, this disease also. So uh, just to finish, let me show you some highlights of my lecture. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a huge vascular affinity. Endothelitis may play a role, a central role in the pathogenesis of the disease. Thrombotic disease is frequent in ICU patients. We have a low impact of COVID-19 in pulmonary hypertension patient, patients so far, but we are, we are waiting for new publications in the future. Maybe we can ask ourselves if there is a protective effect of the pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension in the, in the COVID-19 disease. Or maybe there, there may be a protective, a protective effect of pulmonary hypertension therapies. As, as you can see, I leave you with more questions than answers. Um, so I, I am finishing. I am finishing now. Um, you know, I am from from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, and a couple of weeks ago, the Time Journal published an article uh, where uh, the, art the article says that Argentina is within one uh, of the best responses in the world to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which, is, which, which is very important for us. And I am very, as an Argentinian, I am very proud of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is um, the Nueve de Julio Avenue, which is one of the main, more, more, more important avenues in the heart of Buenos Aires, in the, in the in the downtown, uh, this is the, uh, the Obelisco, uh, one of our famous monuments. In a quarantine day, at the beginning of the quarantine in April, as you can see, there's almost no buses, no cars, no people. Uh, we had a very strict quarantine, uh, and we are doing quite well with the with the pandemic. So thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. And I will be glad uh, to hear questions from the audience.